We're going to continue talking about cardiac pathophysiology. We talked about hypertension and uncontrolled hypertension leading to left ventricular hypertrophy. And we also talked about how that left ventricular hypertrophy eventually may lead to a diastolic dysfunction. And because of that diastolic dysfunction, it could lead to ischemic heart disease in which there's an imbalance between the myocardial oxygen supply and the myocardial oxygen demand. And that can lead to myocardial ischemia. If this imbalance is not corrected or progressively worsens, it could lead to myocardial infarction. Another thing that hypertension can also do is it can accelerate the progression of atherosclerosis. And atherosclerosis is basically an increased development of plaque formation within the vessel walls. For example, the luminal walls of the vessel, there's a plaque formation, a whole complex series of reactions that take place, which we'll talk about later, in which the plaque progressively increases and therefore decreases the luminal area within the vessel. And if that takes place, we can see how this plaque formation can ultimately decrease the coronary blood flow and therefore decrease the oxygen supply to the myocardium. And it's decreasing the oxygen and the nutrients needed for the proper cardiac physiology. Another factor is we, that we talked about is during diastolic dysfunction, this increase of pressure within the left ventricle due to a diastolic dysfunction or a non-compliant left ventricle, that increase in pressure increasing the wall tension and therefore increasing this oxygen demand as well as the decrease in the O2 supply, this factor can lead to myocardial ischemia and in fact it can lead to myocardial infarction. And we can see here that depending on which vessels are affected, it can present itself differently. Here's an example, for example, let's say we had a stenotic vessel because of atherosclerosis and the plaque development within the coronary vessel and for example some type of microembolism or thrombi creates a total occlusion of the coronary vessel it would lead to myocardial ischemia to the heart tissue that's downstream from that vessel and if this myocardial ischemia is not corrected or it gets worse it can lead to myocardial infarction, in which there's a necrotic process that takes place within the myocardium. And the patient may experience chest pain at that time, which is angina. And we also briefly talked about the difference between stable or chronic stable angina versus an unstable angina, in which there's an increased frequency and duration with unstable angina. So if there's a myocardial ischemia or myocardial infarction that takes place, we can detect it through EKG changes. So if we were to look at the EKG, this is a normal EKG here, and we can just see that there's a P wave, which represents the depolarization of the atrium. There's a segment, which is called a PR segment, between the P wave and the QRS complex. And that represents the time that goes, that takes place through the AV node, or the AV node. And then there's a QRS complex, which represents the depolarization of the left ventricle. There's a refractory period, which is the ST segment. And then there's a repolarization of the left ventricle, which is the T wave. Now, if a patient were to suffer from myocardial ischemia or infarction, often than not, we'll see ST segment changes. And we can look here at this EKG, and we can see that there's an ST segment elevation. We can see that the baseline is approximately here, and we can see that there's an elevated ST segment. So this is ST segment elevation that's indicating that some type of myocardial ischemia or myocardial infarction has taken place. Another factor that can take place is that when a patient is suffering from myocardial ischemia or infarction, and experiences chest pain, this is going to provide stress to the patient in which he may or 
send off some catecholamines or stress hormones, for example, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine. And these stress hormones or catecholamines will sensitize the heart and may lead to cardiac dysrhythmias. For example, ventricular tachycardia and V-fib, we can see on an EKG, this is an example of VTAC, ventricular tachycardia. We see that the heart rate is greater than 100 beats per minute, if we were to count the boxes. And we can see that there's a widening of the QRS complex. Compared to a normal EKG, we have a narrow QRS complex. And if you compare that to the widening of the QRS complex, this is indicating ventricular tachycardia. This is an emergency situation. Another emergency life-threatening situation is V-fib, ventricular fibrillation. So this is where you would defibrillate the patient because the myocardium is not contracting properly and the myofibrils are basically fibrillating and just quivering and not generating appropriate contractility and therefore will affect the cardiac output. So you can send the patient for an angiogram and you can try to localize where the stenotic or occluded vessel is and you can also see the degree of stenosis. And for example, if a patient were to go for an angiogram and if there was a plaque formation, you can see that they did an angioplasty and then placed a stent in order to create a patent coronary vessel to reestablish proper coronary blood flow. And you can see here that this is where the widened artery takes place because of a stent that's creating a patent vessel. And this is a compressed plaque formation, or the plaque formation that took place is now is compressed, and therefore the luminal size allows for appropriate coronary blood flow. You cannot do angioplasty or a stent placement if you have a left main, left main coronary artery disease or three vessel disease. Then you would have to go for an open heart surgery. And once a patient goes on the cardiopulmonary bypass machine, for example, through cabbage, coronary artery bypass grafting, and this is where the patient goes on a cardiopulmonary bypass, and once the blood is drained from the IVC and the SVC into a venous reservoir, goes through a gas exchanger, goes through a heat exchanger, and then it returns the blood back into the aorta. And that can be depicted just from a brief basic standpoint. The heart drains its blood, for example, from the SBC and IBC into a venous reservoir. Gas exchange takes place that's acting as an artificial lung in which you introduce O2 and you take out the carbon dioxide and heat exchange is taking place whether you're going to cool the patient down to induce hypothermia for myocardial preservation or you're going to add the heat back when you're going to take the patient off the cardiopulmonary bypass machine. Then the series of filtration systems and the blood is introduced back into the aorta that can return back into the circulation and perfuse all the vital organs. And therefore you can stop the heart and you can work on revascularizing the heart tissue through the process of coronary cabbage procedure. So in the next lecture, we'll talk about what happens to the heart when it's affected by myocardial infarction and therefore may lead to congestive heart failure because you've developed systolic dysfunction.